my observation and when I look at the comment sections under like the radar that I did on Thursday is that there are a lot of people who associate with the right, normal people, not politicos, not journalists, not people who are writing books that have been attracted to narratives like, let's say, Bethany's or Ben Shapiro's or Bill Maher's because they sense that there is something off. They sense that um, Sam Adler Bell definition that I'm so glad you, that you brought up, that there's there's something that feels irritating about this presumption that everybody already knows what the new thing is. And that if I err, if I say the wrong thing, then that is a moral failing of mine instead of just a mistake. That presumption that I should already be quote unquote woke is what's irritating, right? And I, I wish we could just be honest about that and I identify that that's part of the critique that I think I would agree with, that people shouldn't be so smug and self-righteous and moralizing wherever they are in the political spectrum, but my responsibility is to the left. And that is an aspect of what goes on on the left. That's the stereotype of the blue-haired Oberlin student who wants to chew you out. But what I also want to say is that that's a critique that's not just a right critique. People on the left feel that way, too. I just did a girls rewatch because I'm very much of the zeitgeist. And there's this episode where one of the characters who's a woke liberal <laughs> walks into a coffee store, misidentifies someone as a, a woman who identifies as non-binary. They're very smug with him about it. And, and he's like, geez, Louise, OK, fine. Like left Left shows like Girls have been making critiques like this of how irritating it is for people to be smug and know it all about relatively new cultural changes since time immemorial or at least since like 2011. So when we don't acknowledge those things on the left, I feel like it gives a lot of people space to say, well, the only person who who is not gaslighting me about this are people on the right. And then they they buy into a whole other narrative that includes a lot of really ugly stuff. And I found that if I have my left critique of identity politics, my left critique of this, that, and the other, if I will acknowledge and point out how superficial what liberals are doing with race and, and gender issues, then they're like, yeah, that's all I was trying to say. Like, yeah, I totally get that. Yeah, totally. And that's so much healthier than them going over to the conservatives who are saying they're trying to get black people to take over the world and the banks are feeling because there was a, a gay and a veteran on the board, <laughs> you know? But sorry, Freddie, get, get back in. Yeah, I... um. <clears throat> I, one thing I would really like to add to this is I think that a lot of this, I mean, if you just think about it, the whole, this whole conversation is um, about conservative uh, obsession with the language and process norms of the left. And I think that that is an, an artifact of the, like the fact that there's been a total collapse in, uh, in movement conservatism of anything like a positive, a coherent, positive agenda. Right. That the that the right has, has lost whatever it once had in terms of having a vision of what America is supposed to be and where we're supposed to go and how to build things. Um, when I was young, right, like the Republicans were awful, they were terrible, but you could identify what Republican values were. And the fundamental part of all of it was conservative Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, since Trump be became the, the standard bearer for the party. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, you can read reams of things written uh, in conservative publications that never mention Christianity or God once. Right. There's been a collapse in Christianity as being like the, the major organizing principle of the American right. And that goes along with the fact that Donald Trump does not have a, a coherent idea about policy. He's kind of a populist, but not really. I mean, his, his biggest accomplishment was cutting taxes. He doesn't have a coherent foreign policy. Uh, well, the uh, anti-interventionism is a big now dividing line uh, among yeah. Republicans that used to be an, an old faithful. We liked veterans. We liked war. We supported the troops. And now that's completely collapsed. And there's very open and robust debate about whether or not, for example, the conservatives should be supporting uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, you know, uh, Ron DeSantis just coming out with that uh not a letter, but a response, I guess, a written response to a questionnaire that Tucker Carlson put out saying kind of more moderate statements about how, you know, we shouldn't intervene, made a lot of Republicans very upset in the party, but made a lot of Republicans outside of the party very, very happy. I mean, it's kind of a cliche for lefties to say that conservatives are the ones who really do identity politics. But I, I really think that, I mean, this whole woke obsession is a, a pure expression of identity politics, right? It's not about, we're not debating abortion and saying this is moral and this is what policy should be. It's not like a debate about the size, the correct size of the government. 
It's entirely about identifying a certain kind of person, right? Woke is meant to identify a certain kind of person and generating heat based on people's dislike for their, their assumption about what that kind of person and what is. What kind and of I, person, Freddie? Like I said, black, I think is, <laughs> is the most obvious um, yeah. thing for woke, but also, you know, I think, like you said, like the annoying Oberlin grad with blue hair, like that, that sort of cultural archetype. And, you know, I, I think that like the, the Republicans looking forward should be very, very worried because I, I have no idea what the, the basic orienting principles of the party are in post Trump world. Now they're just Trump, right? He's going to die sooner or later. He's in his seventies. And, um, you know, they've hollowed out all their intellectual architecture because everything became about Trump versus never Trump. And the, 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 the party and the, the movement ideology just does not have like the ability to express a coherent, positive vision, which the Democrats have one. It's not great, but it's, they at least have one. You know, what's the Democrats? I mean, I would say, look, it's like <clears throat> it's it's it's. Joe Biden saying, you know, we're not going to let starving families suffer in this country, Jack, you know, and then proposing a tax subsidy that's immensely complex. And that because of how it works, it leaves out like 40 percent of the people it should be helping. And every year they have to fight like hell to get Joe Manchin to, to vote to, to reauthorize it. But it's a it's a program that exists. Right. Or it's it's a commitment to. It, you know, fighting climate change, that's mostly about subsidies to massive corporations to make, you know, you, you know uh, lower carbon uh, technology at the same time as he's now drilling in in Alaska where you couldn't drill. Before, Freddie, right? this is not sounding like a very coherent policy on the left either, or, or among liberals either. You well, know, well, the, the other thing is you absolutely know that the Democrats will protect Social Security and Medicare. Freddie, and- do I? Well, well, they will com- <laughs> campaign on protecting. Uh, Freddie, Social Freddie, Security Freddie. Uh, Bernie Sanders had to like low key threaten to run against Barack Obama in 2012 because there were murmurings and whisperings that he was going to cut Social Security. He was on board with some of these uh, Tim Ryan esque uh, uh, cuts. Well, I mean, I, I, look, I think that if you ask like what party it has a better track record of protecting entitlements, right? The party that where. Paul Ryan was the Paul idea Ryan's man idea. not that long ago. Um, it's not going to take up that that mantle. Um, I, yeah, look, I think the Democrats are a bunch of weenies, but um, it, the, it, there's obviously not the same level of nihilism as there is on the other side. I, I struggle with that, not because I'm trying to say Republicans and Democrats are exactly the same, but I think the difficulty in articulating a vision for either party right now has to do with the fact that both parties have leaned so heavily into cultural issues as an organizing principle. And this isn't new, right? Even abortion isn't a cultural issue. It is a real substantive right. But it became a cultural issue in terms of the way that it was marketed and used politically for so many years. So it's, I'm not, and, and race in, in and of itself, the civil rights movement, equality movements have always been used this way since the Southern strategy and the democratic realignment. So I'm not like, this isn't like new, new, but I do think that it is coming to its most absurd, exaggerated form where you have the potential Republican front runner saying that my state, Florida, is the state where wokeness is going to die, is actively engaged in litigation over, which he has to define the term wokeness, defines it beautifully, in a way that Robin DiAngelo would be proud of, that that in and of itself is an admission that he is not supportive of the equality goals of wokeness, that wokeness speaks to. Um, and you, at the same time, you have polls that show that most Floridians are confused about what the term even means or how they should feel about it. And with most Americans feeling favorably about the term. And, and, and so I don't know, from a political perspective, Osita, do you see this as something that's a dying movement, a growing movement? Are Republicans effective here? You know, you see them doing things now. There's this Minnesota um, state official who was grandstanding about how there is no child hunger in Minnesota and there, therefore we should cut food programs. That's being juxtaposed, juxtaposed with what Freddie is saying about how at least Joe Biden 
says he supports things like child tax credits and, and, and free lunch and things like that. But of course, the Democrats can't actually manage to pass those pro and sustain those programs for long periods of time. I mean, is is the fact that we have people making making these uh, making wokeness the centerpiece of their politics because politics, substantive politics is absolutely bereft on both sides of the aisle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's, you know, Freddie talked about this already. Like, um, I mean, my, my take on all of this has been these are the kinds of politics you turn to on the right when you've basically won, right? So the movement for a long time was about what? Like lowering taxes and keeping them low, demolishing the labor movement, dismantling the regulatory state. Um, kind of mission accomplished on all of those fronts. And so what, what do you sell in a you know, so what do you what do you have left to sell to people to get them angry and active? Uh, you know, it's the, the green M M, you know, like it's 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 kind of like a desperation about it. Which doesn't mean which isn't to say that it's um I don't know. I, I don't know that we we're in a place where we can say how effective it's going to be in the long run. I do think that we have plenty of evidence that it hasn't been as effective as they've hoped in the last couple of years. So what's um, the Democrats' excuse? If the Republicans are doing woke politics because they've already won, why have Democrats... I mean, they, we can't both have won. Because or they can't is there... win. Because they can't win. Because, because the Democrats are in this place where we have political institutions. First of all, they don't want to do... Mm-hmm. Kind of material politics we do, we want to do. That's the base. Like, they just, uh-huh. just disagree yes. with us. But I think I think it's important to like even people who are like more social democratically minded or who want to expand the welfare state and do good stuff. Well, you have a political system that makes all of that very very difficult. Um, so what do you sell to people? We're going to be the party that represents you um, as a matter of descriptive representation. We're going to put the first African American, the first Latina, the first this or that. Into office. So, so Deb Holland can right co-sign thing. drilling in the Arctic. That's that's that on that side. So that's what you offer to people, or wind yeah. up offering to people too. So you know, I think that there there are ways in which political institutions and their design, and like economic, like there, there's like a very boring and dry conversation we can have about like why, why all of this is happening. Um, that I write about more. So, but I think the more interesting question is like, what do we do um, in response as the left? Um, if it is true that people have abandoned material politics on both conventional political camps, that should leave us with an opportunity. Here's an unclaimed space we can be developing, pushing around proposals on. Um, so how can we do that? And what, what's preventing us from doing that? And this is where I think the rubber hits the road as far as the wokeness conversation is concerned. It's a matter of like, why does this actually, why, why, why do we actually care about this beyond you know, what conservative people are saying? Um, you know, I mean, I think the the underlying debate on the left about this stuff is, you know, to what extent can we blame the Oberlin person for progressives not doing stuff? Or to what extent is the Oberlin person an obstacle? Um, and, you know, I, I've written a lot about various questions attached to this. I don't like writing about it um, that much, honestly, because I feel like Sometimes I'm, I'm represented as saying, well, I don't believe the Oberlin person exists or that cancel culture exists or that Robin DiAngelo is like a real thing. I mean, that's not really not really something I've ever said. I think the point I, I'm making um, in all of my pieces in writing about this is, you know, I don't think it helps us to suggest that those aspects of our politics are dominating or happening to the exclusion of better politics when they're not. Like, I think that there is a level of exaggeration and hyperbole about some of this stuff that doesn't really help us and that actually confuses us about what's what's really I, going I on. Think, and that's I not think to say that we, we can't critique those people. You know, Sammy Tyler, Maurice Mitchell. There are critiques that are being made of progressive identity politics that I think are worthwhile and that also cut against the idea that nobody can criticize this stuff it's not true people are and people do and it's important that they do um, i think i think that's true but it's also important to note that the hyperbole the exaggeration around the oberlin student isn't that you know some of it is i was gonna say this isn't that joe biden is, is, is like inviting the oberlin student to the state of the union although it is true that there has been there have been choices that have been made 
um, like uh, the sit down he did with um, the trans activist Dylan, I forget her last name, that have been cultural, you know, touchstones like spikes in the, the public sphere. But generally speaking, it's also libs of TikTok. It's Republicans trying, digging deep and reaching for yeah. every example that is aberrant yeah. in, among mainstream anybody of any political stripe and yeah. foregrounding it. So the open well, president is always right. going to exist so, and I mean, Oberlin, they're Oberlin's allowed actually, to exist. So it's actually a bad example because, you know, to your point, and I've, I've written about this too, like the thing that people said happened to Oberlin did not in fact happen. Like that situation is characterized that happens all the time, you know? Um, so well, you're right. Like there, there are, are. I didn't mean a specific Oberlin instance. No, but, I just no, meant... but, I, but I think to your point, like there's, I just there's a way on the which... school. Generally speaking, we can say yeah, Wellesley no, we or all, Berkeley. We or... Know, yeah, no. I mean, the, we we know we know we know what we're we're talking about here. But but I, I only said that just to to agree with you that there is a drive to jump on these kinds of instances, not only in the right wing press but in the centrist press as well. And, and I think, as I was saying earlier, like the point of this is to suggest that progressives are incapable of rational debate. They don't have a real politics. They're crazy. They're stupid. They're dumb. They're not worth engaging with. That's what is happening when people hype on these uh, these kinds of instances, which is not to say that they're not real or worth addressing or that nothing bad is happening or nothing counterproductive is happening. I think it's true, but I think it's important to keep things in perspective. Um, so when, so for, to make, you know, another, another specific example. Um, so Freddie wrote this piece about wokeism just a, I guess it was yesterday that I was responding to. Um, and you talked about the Oscars, right? So there's been this drive now in Hollywood to expand representation and to say that we're going to nominate more black directors and black actors and black films and, and all of that. Um, and you suggested that like one of the, you know, this, this the, the attention that was given to the Oscars is a reason why uh, right to work in Michigan is not like a, a ma- more significant topic of discussion, um, which I don't think is is the case, right? I think that wokeness or not, the proportion of Americans who would know about the Oscars is probably higher than the proportion of Americans who know about labor law in Michigan. But I think that that's like one small example of like ascribing, I think, a little bit too much to cultural trends that are kind of shallow and, um, you know, evasive and and smoke screens. I think, you know, you can make those critiques. Um, but I don't I don't know that we should make the mistake of saying that the left is where it is now. Um because of these politics or that these politics have prevented us from making material gains or like, I, I think that there's, there's, there are ways in which we, you know, do the rights work in suggesting that, you know, left politics, progressive politics have been overtaken by silliness. You know, I don't, I just, I don't think that there's enough evidence to justify the position personally for me. Let me give like, a, like a, I think like a specific example of where I think, um, politics that might be called woke i think can get in the way of like a material analysis so that would be like um the concept of the model the model minority and the myth of the model minority the uh, you know the the model min- minority idea being that asian americans are the model minority because of their flourishing in a lot of these demographic categories um if you just put the model minority into google and you start reading through, you'll find dozens and dozens and dozens of takes, um, almost all of them written by Asian American writers, in which um, they talk about the way that the model min- minority uh, myth is a myth. It's not true, um, that it is a undue burden that Asian people have to live under, that it is um, it doesn't reflect the lived experience of Asian people, et cetera, et cetera. And I have no uh, disagreement with any of that. And I think that it's worth saying. But <clears throat> the problem is, um, you know, we have to also understand that the reason that the model minority idea popped up is because it really is true that Asian Americans have the highest incomes, uh, are the most educated by far, have dramatically lower crime rates, uh, have a lot of higher life expectancies, are significantly less likely to be obese, have diabetes heart disease, et cetera, and et cetera, right? Like that didn't come from nowhere. 
But if you just look at the vast majority of the commentary on this idea, it's all fronting the idea that the idea of the model minority is this horrible distortion that that isn't true and that it's a, a racist vestige that Asian Americans have to live with. My, my uh, uh, girlfriend is Korean. She's a large sort of Asian social circle. And in that social circle, you, you can't just talk about them, the sort of the model minority um, <clears throat> without immediately being told, oh, I've read so many things about how that's a, that's a myth and how it's not true. And it's a good example of where I have absolutely no interest in policing Asian people's feelings towards them. But it is also important to stay grounded in reality about these demographic factors that have massive implications for uh, the quality of life of Asian people. And if we're going to fight racial inequality, we have to have our eyes open like on these kinds of big demographic statistical realities. And that's just like one small example of like of a place where um, if you look at the commentary, the emotional part, right? How do I feel about the idea of the model minority has just eaten the material analysis. But right? Freddie, isn't the argument, the argument isn't that those demographics, demographic realities don't exist. The argument is that overgeneralizing and, and kind of stereotyping people when you meet them on the basis of those, demo, those statistics is a problem. The same way that I don't think that Black people are arguing that we aren't overrepresented in crime statistics or poverty statistics or things like that. The problem is meeting some a Black person and assuming they're poor or intrinsically violent and things like that. Moreover, my understanding of the model minority critique is that it aggregates different kinds of Asian immigrants that in a way that really invisibilizes how poor, how bad off um, certain groups from Southeast Asia are as compared to uh, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean immigrants in particular. And so I, I I know what you're saying. I do think that there is a kind of way that people do. There is sometimes a way that people who want to be woke, for lack of better words, catch on to, I think, a legitimate analysis of how we shouldn't overgeneralize and stereotype people because there are nuances to the statistical realities. And they say, well, it's racist to say model minority, like it's racist to acknowledge demographic trends. And I think that that definitely does happen. That definitely is true. But I, I also don't think that there, there isn't a legitimate defensiveness that people can have about not wanting to be stereotyped in those ways or pushing back against the way that the model minority myth in particular or the model minority idea in particular is used as a wedge issue to also attack Blacks, Latinos, and Native Americans who are on the other side of those demographic trends. Yeah, I mean, look, like I would just say, again, it's about the crowding out of different kinds of ideas because the focus is so intent on feeling valid, feeling whatever, on the, you know, the lived experience of how I feel because of the, the myth of the model minority. When to me, right, I would like to expand out what, uh, again, on average, of course, there's many Asian people who are in poverty, et cetera, but I would like to sort of spread that right to other racial demographics. And I think that like asking the question, what has made uh, Asian Americans capable of rising to those heights um, is really important. And so that we can so that we, we can replicate it. Right. So that we can use it as a way to guide us to, to, to move forward. Right. And the other thing that I would say is that, um, you know, it's if we're going to have a frank conversation about black poverty. We can't every time we mention black poverty stop and say, but I really need to say that uh, there's many black people who are actually quite rich and, and there's many fabulously wealthy black people. Right? We, we understand when we talk about black poverty that we're not talking about every individual black person, but that we're talking about a broad demographic trend, which has social relevance, whether we want to talk about it or not. Right. And, and that's the sort of thing, like just being frank about the fact that people from different racial groups in this country, on average, have very different lived experiences, you can say, on a whole no a whole number of metrics. And like having that kind of conversation to me to like, I think has gotten much harder in a way that I don't think is beneficial for what we're trying to do. What do you make of that, Osita? I don't know. I mean, this is, I think this is a matter of like how people personally experience left politics and you know the kinds of spaces that they're in somewhat you know um the kind of conversations that you personally have had 
Um, so, I mean, I, I can only really speak for myself on the uh, model minority question. My, my, my perception of that has been, you know, there is obviously, as Freddie was saying, recognition now that that stereotype um, has failed to capture the extent to which, you know, there are Asians in poverty, there are Asian communities that really struggle with a lot of things that if you look at the aggregate statistics, you don't necessarily see. I think that's a live conversation now too. Has that overtaken um, an understanding of Asian Americans as being uh, broadly advantaged in relative position to Black people or Hispanic people? I don't know that that's, that's the case. As a matter of fact, you know, when, and we're going to talk about this more and more, I guess, in the coming months, depending on what happened with the uh, affirmative action. I mean, I think that there have been live conversations in social justice, progressive, whatever you want, whatever you want to call them, circles about you know Asian and white solidarity um, when it comes to educational admissions and metrics and people saying you know Asian people have to be doing do better recognizing the privilege in these races and, and so on like I think that that's a complex <laughs> conversation with a lot of different camps and you know as in any debate you're going to find people who take dogmatic positions and you want to shut down conversation but I actually think that there are a lot of perspectives on on the model minority stuff in my own my own reading but this is this is kind of what i was getting at before like you know i i i think that there's there's a a general tendency now to suggest that in progressive politics because you have these kinds of very loud dogmatic voices it is now literally impossible to say certain things or to have certain conversations um and I just, I just don't know that that is actually the case in my experience. Again, I think that you see people, especially in the last year or two, I've, you know, a lot of good writing on, you know, the grifting, the straight up grifting that happens in identity politics. You know, the 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 the, the shallowness of a lot of it. You know, yeah, I think the Black Lives critiques. Matter story, the Black Lives Matter story. You know, huge. like you know, and, yeah. and and that's that's all been, you know, integrated in this way. You you can make those critiques, and nobody's going to come out and bang on your door, and you know stab you or something like I, I feel like there's there's a, a touchiness about saying certain things um that i'm not exactly sure yeah is justified. Like, I, I, I think there's agree. more room for debate that people than people appreciate I, I i'm not saying that there isn't like a degree of backlash i have received a great deal of that backlash but you know it wasn't fatal <laughs> and it wasn't career ending quite the opposite and i have talked about things that don't i don't have democrat demographic protection for Yes, it's easier for me to talk about identity politics and critique identity politics as a black woman. But I also have talked about Israel, Palestine. I've talked about other issues related to Judaism. And there have been there has been backlash. And I've been accused of a lot of things. I've been accused of hating Ukrainian children and people with blue eyes and all kinds of things on the Internet. And so I'm not saying that there isn't backlash and like aren't social consequences for doing things. This idea that people are so afraid to speak because they're worried about social censorship or sanction I think speaks to one's own lack of confidence sometimes that they can defend their point of view and know that their opinions aren't racist or sexist or uh, um, anti-Semitic or whatever it is they're being accused of. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon.com slash podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.